Aliana, when you're ready to start greeting people. Great. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Governor's Town Hall to discuss, discuss IDA recovery and resources. We're happy you all could join us. Tonight's Town Hall will be a webinar, so you'll help be able to see the speakers on your screen um, and ask questions through our Q&A box, which is a tab at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to answer those questions as they come in, provide answers from our panelists, um, or follow up after the event with an answer for you. Um, so it looks like we're mostly ready to go. So with your permission, Governor, I'd like to open it up to question or to connect you with folks we have on the line who are eager to hear about IDA recovery and resources. And for everyone's awareness, after the call ends, we will be sending out um, a follow-up to those who registered with important resources on the topic. Um, with that, I'd like to welcome the governor of the state of New Jersey, Phil Murphy. Aliana, thank you. Um, the, you said you'd follow up. Will that be in an email form to everybody? Yes. Okay. And we had just under 400 folks register for this. So welcome, everybody. Um, great to have you. And, and I want to just uh, ask everybody keeps uh, Deb Kornavaka in, in their prayer. She had a a passing in her family and uh, keep her in your prayers. And I wanna thank Aliana for stepping up uh, last minute and pinch hitting uh, to coordinate uh, this call. Uh, we're gonna be joined, I think in a few minutes by Senator Cory Booker, uh, which is terrific. Uh, we are joined again as we were last week by FEMA Federal Coordinating Officer and a good friend, Patrick Cornbill. Uh, we'll hear from both of them in a few minutes. And we also have with us to help answer your questions Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, Sean LaTourette, uh, the Human Services Department's Acting Commissioner, Sarah Edelman, Chief of Staff of the Department of Banking and Insurance, Justin Zimmerman. Uh, as always, in this case, he's in an automobile, Superintendent of the State Police, Colonel Pat Callahan, and last but not least, Dan Kelly, who's the Executive Director of the Governor's Disaster Recovery Office. And again, we did this last week in a similar format uh, and I think we're able to, there's Senator Booker. Senator, great to have you with us. Um, we were able to, um, I think, impart information as well as answer a, a bunch of questions just inside of an hour. And we're going to do the same format uh, today. So just by virtue of who's on the call, and again, Senator, great to have you with us. A disaster response must be a whole of government process from the federal to the state, to the county, to the local, everybody pulling together. And that is exactly what we're trying to do here to help everyone impacted by the floods and tornadoes that accompanied the remnants of Tropical Storm Ida a few weeks ago. This was the worst natural disaster to hit our state since Sandy in 2012. 12 counties have met the threshold for FEMA to make a major disaster declaration enabling homeowners, especially those who did not carry flood insurance, to seek FEMA assistance to rebuild and restore. I once again urge everybody to look into purchasing flood insurance. Where it rains, it can flood, and it's best to prepare for the future today. I am grateful to President Joe Biden and his team, to Patrick uh, and his, his colleagues at FEMA, to Senator Booker and our congressional delegation, uh, to everybody on this call, but especially Colonel Callahan, Dan, Dan Kelly in the Office of Emergency Manager to the State Police, and everybody who got this process moving so quickly and has kept it moving forward. The work of the county-based walk-in FEMA disaster recovery centers is drawing to a close. That doesn't mean FEMA is leaving us, but the actual physical centers will begin to shut down. FEMA assistance will continue to be available online and over the phone. Um, and we'll give you those emails and uh, addresses and phone numbers. We're grateful to everyone at FEMA uh, who has helped staff these centers. We, we have many state programs to help families get back on their feet. That's why I've asked members of our cabinet to be with us today, where you have questions, they have answers and guidance. We are committed, I wanna say this unambiguously, to making sure every family has the resources they need to get back on their feet, back in a clean and safe home and back to their lives. We are committed to making sure we don't just rebuild, but that we re rebuild and build back more resiliently. It's not a matter of if, the next devastating storm hits, it's about when and making sure we're prepared. I know Sean LaTourette has already had three very senior level meetings with one general and two colonels at the Army Corps of Engineers trying try to figure out how we can mitigate against some of what we saw in, in the tragedy a few weeks ago. So in the days after the 
floods and tornadoes. I toured multiple communities and I spoke with many families. I saw homes filled with mud. I saw entire homes swept off their foundation. I saw gutted downtown small businesses. And I saw, most tragically of all, uh, we saw sadly 30 losses of lives and, and accumulated memories piled high on sidewalks or strewn about people's yards. But I also saw the resilience and goodness of our people, neighbors helping neighbors and even perfect strangers stepping in to help families clean up. One thing Ida's floods and tornadoes could not sweep away were our Jersey values. To each and every one of you, I say thank you. We're gonna stay with you. I wish I could say this is gonna be an overnight recovery. It won't be, but we will stay with you on the whole journey. I don't know where it would be without, without him, um, but an extraordinary leader, extraordinary Senator, please help me welcome for a few words of wisdom, Senator Cory Booker. Hey, uh, I wanna thank you, Governor. You have been given a master's class in leadership in crisis. Uh, obviously, we've had the hurricane, but I also want to, again, reflect upon your leadership during the uh, pandemic, which has been uh, catastrophic for our nation, uh, but far less so uh, for our state because of your leadership and that of your incredible team that I've had the honor of working with so closely uh, during these last couple of years. I apologize to you, Governor. I am literally sitting in Chuck Schumer's alcove, not my office, because there is a heated uh, leadership meeting going on with uh, Chuck Schumer's inner, inner circle, which New Jersey's afforded me the opportunity to join. I'm gonna to have to speak and go back into that sort of fight over the issues of reconciliation, debt ceiling rise, there's a lot going on here in DC. But I did wanna just let everyone know uh, that now uh, we've got past October 1st, which is just a month since uh, Hurricane Ida hit our state. Uh, as the governor said, he and I uh, both had heartbreaking experiencing visiting communities and homes and renters homeowners it, it, just seeing the carnage of that storm in terms of the property damage and obviously we tragically lost 30 residents uh, this is not going to be something that we can just flip a switch and clean up it's going to be a long and difficult process and from the very moments the storm was hitting uh, me and my colleagues and i want to give a lot of gratitude to the senior senator for the state of new jersey bob menendez we went to work on the senate side and we're able to get what's called a continuing resolution passed through the Senate and ultimately by our House delegation and others uh, passed all through Congress. It's providing about $28.6 billion for disaster relief for major disasters of 2020 and 2021, including funding for some critical programs that will help support New Jersey families devastated by Hurricane Ida. Critically, the CR provides uh, includes $5 billion for HUD's Community Development Fund for major disasters. These funds have broad eligibility for economic revitalization, infrastructure, and as we know after the storm, the urgent need, housing is included. And again, I, I've heard from homeowners across our state the desperate need that they have for federal assistance after the historic flooding uh, from Hurricane Ida, and we, we have got the start of those resources coming to our state. In particular, the resources folks should know can be used towards the repair, elevation, and in many cases, the acquisition of homes that have been severely damaged and are at risk of being damaged again by future weather events. There's also a $1.2 billion worth of loans to the SBA for individuals and businesses and for nonprofits, which includes religious institutions. Over $5 billion was included uh, to support the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, in part to accelerate flood and storm re risk uh, reduction projects. Jersey has had a number of critical flood risk redemption, uh, reduction projects that really could benefit, we know this, from these resources and make New Jersey more resilient to future disasters. I said that the day after the storm, that we've got to focus not just on the repair and the recovery uh, for all that have been affected, but we've got to focus on resiliency as well. Uh, there's also a $2.6 billion in this for the U.S. Department of Transportation to reimburse states that suffer damage to roads and bridges, states like New Jersey. The disaster relief provisions in the CR, however, to my mind and determination, oh, are just a first step, and Congress must do more to support a far greater and more robust federal role in New Jersey's long-term recovery. I understand that New Jersey alone will need significantly more funds 
through the community development block grant program I discussed earlier to address damage to homes across the state and additional assistance to local governments and small businesses. And we need to make more investments in pre-disaster mitigation projects that will make New Jersey more resilient and protect the homes of future of families for future storms. And so I'm gonna to continue to work with my colleagues. One of the reasons why I'm going back into that uh, small room with Chuck Schumer uh, to make sure that we are continuing in every opportunity to advocate for New Jersey's needs in other approaching legislative vehicles, such as the year end omnibus spending bill that Congress must work on in the coming weeks uh, prior to the uh, government funding deadline in, in early December. These are opportunities and I plan on doing everything I can to make sure the resources that our state needs are in those big programs. And please know that, that as an additional disaster supplemental legislation, as we work to bring that together in Congress, I'll be working hand in hand uh, with our great governor. Uh, I'm gonna be working, continuing to work with his great team uh, to make sure that we are doing everything necessary from his vantage point and of course, my team is working with communities and families directly across New Jersey that have been impacted by Hurricane Ida. And I just want to say again, uh, Governor, you, you get a lot of credit. I know the First Lady has been out there also. I just want to give her a mention uh, that you are really making this uh, a, a passion project, not just uh, uh, through the powers granted you by the state of New Jersey, but your heart and your grit uh, have made a real difference. And so. Uh, Governor, with your leave, I'm going to get back into that other room and let your team handle the Q&A. Uh, there's a great group of experts that are here, uh, and I look forward to continuing to fight for New Jersey and Washington and to be back home and to continue to help out uh, with the effort for recovery. Or I cannot thank you enough. Uh, it means more than you know. You and Bob and the whole delegation have been just incredible. So it takes a village, and you all are more than pulling your way, I could say that. Good luck in that room. And by the way, remind them that it was from about the time you and I met that there's a movie about you called Street Fight. It may, yeah. it may be, it may come in, it may come in handy in the next few days. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Thank All you. Right, take care of yourself. Be well. Bye Good now. luck. Thank you. Uh, that was terrific. Uh, one more speaker before we go to questions. Uh, again, he's become a good friend, outstanding leader. Uh, Patrick Cornbill, the Federal Coordinating Office of FEMA Region 2. And Patrick, I mentioned before you jump in that some of these uh, in-person centers will begin to shut down, but that doesn't mean you're going away. And, and uh, disasterassistance.gov continues to be uh, a great website for everybody to have right on their forehead, disasterassistance.gov. With that, Patrick Cornbill, welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Governor. Thank you for inviting me. And thank, thank all of you for taking a bit of time to... Uh, uh, to give me a bit of time to explain a bit about what FEMA can do to help. I know if people are dialing into this call to hear that, they, they've got a lot to deal with uh, in their disaster recovery. And let me, let me first just say that uh, if anybody out there has immediate emergency needs, like they need a roof over their head tonight or uh, food on their table today, uh, that voluntary agencies and local governmental resources are the fastest way to get those things the most uh, for those immediate needs. And let me also say that uh, the most comprehensive way to, to replace all those things that you lost in a disaster is through your private insurance. So you should file a claim with them as well. FEMA's disaster assistance is really intended just to give people a habitable, clean, secure place to stay at following a disaster and not really meant to replace everything, just to give realistic expectations of what it's gonna entail. Um, you can register for federal disaster assistance at disasterassistance.gov or calling our 1-800 number, 1-800-621-FEMA. And we'll have people put that in the, in the chat room and get it out by, by email to, uh, to everyone on the call. Um, what FEMA's assistance is, is uh, initially when you register for assistance, they'll refer you to FEMA's housing programs. And that can uh, supply repair money for people to repair their homes so they can get back into their homes and or rental assistance to stay somewhere else while they repair their home uh, until they can get back in. Um, beyond that, what we do is refer people to the Small Business Administration for a loan for homeowners and renters as well as businesses. And the reason we do that is we can simply uh, uh, 
afford a lot more money through a loan program than a grant program. And that will cover a lot of things that people have lost, uh, a lot more personal property and, uh, and, and damage beyond what FEMA's programs can cover. Now, it's important to fill that out for two reasons. One, it's a lot of money. It's a lot more money than we can afford to give in grants. And the other one is that if, uh, you know, if you say, well, I can't afford a loan and, or that's the last thing I need right now, well, you might be right. And if the SBA agrees with you on that, they'll refer you back to FEMA for potentially more grants. So it's important that people fill those things out. Um, uh, once you register with FEMA, you should hear back from us uh, uh, from an inspector to schedule an inspection uh, within a matter of days. If you don't hear back from FEMA in, in 10 to 14 days, please give us a call back at that 1-800 number. Um, and you might get a letter in the mail or email your correspondence of choice from when you registered. Uh, please read those very carefully. Sometimes they use words like denied, but it says denied pending submission of your insurance information, something like that. So be sure to read those carefully. And also, as the governor mentioned, we do have our in-person disaster recovery centers uh, out there that people can go visit in person and get that kind of help from both FEMA and the Small Business Administration and, and other agencies uh, in person. And as the governor said, some of, our, uh, some of our centers that had very few people showing up, we've reallocated those people to, to other centers and looking to open new ones even. So, uh, so no, FEMA is not going anywhere anytime soon. We're, we're here for the long haul to, to help you through your recovery. And with that said, I don't wanna take up too much of your time. I'll, I wanna to get to your questions. So thank you very Patrick, much. Patrick, thank you for that. So I, a couple of things I wanna underscore, disasterassistance.gov, 1-800-621-FEMA. I see Jack Camp is on from SBA. Patrick, is it sba.gov? Is that their website? That's correct, sba.gov. Yep, sba.gov. And I heard you say something which you said last week, don't take no for an answer. Uh, come back in. If you get denied, you just just stay at it. Um, again, if you if your case has merit, and overwhelmingly everyone's case has merit, or we wouldn't be on this call together. Um, stay stay at it. Um, and by the way, expect that round trip that Patrick described. Patrick, that's not unusual, right? Starting at FEMA, heading out over to SBA, and maybe getting directed back again to FEMA. That's correct, sir. That that happens quite commonly. Yep. So uh, folks expect that. So with that, thank you, Patrick. Aliana, uh, do you want to start reading out some questions? We're going to we're going to stay together till just before quarter after the hour. So hopefully we can get to a bunch and I'll try to direct them uh, to the best person, uh, the most qualified to answer. Yes, so our first question comes from Ahmet from Piscataway, and he touches on assistance for renters, which was a popular topic that we got a lot of questions on. Ahmet says his rent has more than doubled and wants to know if there will be rental assistance program available. And he also would like information about how displaced tenants are being assisted. Patrick, do you want to take a crack at that? And then maybe I'll ask Dan Kelly to come in. Uh, sure, yeah, FEMA may be able to help with rental assistance if somebody needs a, a place to stay because they're, they're uh, residence was made uninhabitable by, habitable by the disaster. Um, we pay out fair market values and we've actually waived something to go a little bit of, above what the standard fair market value is in, in certain counties where we think people are having trouble uh, finding an affordable place to stay. Um, but FEMA, if you use that money that FEMA gives you for rental assistance, if you use it for that rental assistance and re-register, we can give you more. So you can continue to renew that through FEMA uh, in, in one month increments to, uh, to continue getting rental assistance from FEMA until we can get you back into your, to your home. Thank you, Dan, anything you wanna add? I'll go ahead and follow up there, um, I think. You got a big echo, Dan. Sorry about that. Is that better now? Yep. Sorry about that. No, I would just follow up, uh, Patrick, FEMA, they, they have the, uh, the sort of federal process covered. I'd urge uh, renters to also look into the state programs that are potentially available if they have unmet needs from FEMA and from their insurance. Uh, and those primarily are through our New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency. They obviously have the COVID program. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, our Department of Community Affairs has rental programs uh, available through some of our COVID money, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program in particular. I'd urge renters to uh, certainly look into that as a potential resource as well. Um, in addition to contacting NJ211 for any potential nonprofit assistance that may be out there. So NJ211, Dan, do you know what the, the rental assistance website is? And if we don't know it, Aliana, can you post that for everybody or include it in your email? 
Sure, Governor, it's uh, generally nj.gov forward slash DCA. We'll bring you to the DCA main page and the rental assistance is right there. Fantastic. Aliana, if you could add that in the follow-up email among other places people can go. Terrific, thanks, Dan. Aliana, what do you got? So our next question comes from Catherine from Piscataway. And she asks, what mitigation steps, if any, are planned to build back better so we aren't endangered when the next major flood event occurs? You're muted, Governor. Apologies. I, I toured uh, Piscataway uh, a couple of days after Ida with Mayor Brian Waller in, in an apartment complex that was completely clobbered by the river. Sean, give us a sense of what you you see that, that we can we could steps we could take in terms of mitigation so we don't have to keep seeing the same same thing again. Sure, happy to do that, Governor. Uh, you know, thankfully under the governor's leadership, we have. Uh, move forward uh, at the DEP in working with our local communities in order to engage in climate resilience planning that will help to better prepare communities uh, for an increase in severe storms. At the same time, we are examining uh, all at the governor's direction, the increase in flood uh, hazard standards that will help uh, to ensure that our communities are better protected uh, as the governor has said, uh, moving back from and up from uh, those chronically inundated areas is really going to help our communities in the long term. And while we do that, we're also working with our friends at the Army Corps of Engineers. I, I met today with the, uh, the commander or the general of the North Atlantic District and earlier uh, weeks met with both the colonels from the New York and the Philly district on the projects that we are working uh, to deploy to reduce flood risk, uh, whether along the Raritan River or the Passaic or uh, our coastal areas uh, and inland alike. Uh, so we're firing on all cylinders, uh, but it, it requires concerted effort. And I know we have a lot of willing partners across our local governments as well. Sean, some of those, uh, thank you for that. Some of those projects are mega in terms of size and, and cost and time timeline, and we need them. So that's, that, that's just because they're big and, and take a long time doesn't mean that they're not worthy. Are there quick hits that you think we can, steps we can take, take in the here and now that at least shave off some of the potential devastation from another storm that looks like this one? The most important thing, uh, and I mean, the answer is yes, absolutely, Governor. They're, they're the most important thing that we can do immediately and that, that every resident can uh, talk with us at the DEP about and talk with their local government about is how we better manage the stormwater that our developments create now, right? Our infrastructure needs to be right size to manage uh, that in uh, to manage that influx from an increase in precipitation, seven to 11 percent increase in precipitation between now and 2050 because of climate change. And so we can, every time we build a new thing, better manage that stormwater through porous pavement, through uh, engineered green spaces that will better capture stormwater while it beautifies communities. And so we're working with uh, our local communities on that as well. Great. Well, well, uh, well done. Uh, stick around. I bet you we'll have more coming your way here. Thank you. Aliana, back to you. Um, next, we have a question for Maureen from Woodbridge. She asks, is it necessary to take an SBA loan to qualify for help from FEMA? And will FEMA assistance be granted without an SBA loan? Uh, Patrick, you should weigh in, but I, I, it is not a requirement to get assistance from FEMA, right? You, you, uh, no, that's, that's right, Governor. It's not. Uh, what will happen is we'll, we'll put you into FEMA's housing assistance grant program as an initial round, and that's repair money or rental assistance money to make sure you've got a place to stay for now. And that's all grant based. It's not income dependent or anything like that. It's just a, based on need, on immediate need. And beyond that grant program, then we might send you a small business administration disaster loan application to get you more assistance on top of that. Uh, if you can't afford a loan like that, if you think a loan is a really bad idea for you and the SBA agrees with you, we, they, they can refer you back to FEMA for more grants. So it's important to fill out that application, even if you think you don't want the loan. 
Um, and also in, in answer to your mitigation question, small business administration loans for homeowners can, uh, uh, can, uh, can offer money on top of the replacement money and repair money to, to build upon something better as well. So it's another reason that SBA program is a good program. So back, back to a point you made earlier before Maureen's very good question. The fact of the matter is there's less grant money than there is loan money. Loans can be bigger, uh, typically have the ability to scale up versus the grant money. So it could well be a combination, Patrick, of both, right? You could get grant money from FEMA and an SBA loan. And I, Patrick cool. also made the point that if both the individual, Maureen in this case, and the SBA agree that the loan would be dangerous in terms of credit worthiness and ability to repay, and the SBA agrees with that, it, you may well find yourself doing a round trip back to FEMA with the potential to get more grants than you got the first time. Is that fair, Patrick? That's absolutely right, Governor. Okay. Aliana, thank you. So Cheryl from Edison asks, what resources outside of FEMA and SBA are available to resource to residents who have lost their homes? So why don't we tackle this, uh, Patrick and Dan, why don't we do this federal and then separately uh, state? Uh, Patrick, anything else in the federal arsenal that you've got? Uh, well, the, the FEMA programs and the SBA are the primary, primary means of federal assistance. Um, we can also refer people uh, onto voluntary agencies for, for unmet needs. Um, and there may be other, other assistance available further down the pike, what the Senator Booker was talking about, the supplementary appropriations that were passed uh, that may result in some additional forms of federal help, but it, it's a little too soon to say what those will be yet. Well, well uh, said, and you also referred to non-governmental actors and FEMA can get, get folks connected with uh, charitable organizations and other non-government uh, actors. Dan, what about on the on the state level? Sure. Uh, Governor, yes, on the uh, state level. Okay, Patrick. Uh, on the state level, uh, we've consolidated really the state resources that are available to individuals on the nj.gov forward slash IDA page. And that's for potential housing assistance. If you have mental health needs, um, as Sean LaTourette mentioned, um, sort of uh, potential uh, mitigation projects that might be out there, um, really connecting homeowners, renters, businesses with resources that are potentially offered through our agencies out there. Um, and on top of that, the nonprofit world can't be disregarded. They're vital partners here in this recovery effort. And whether you need muck out, um, just assistance navigating that nonprofit world, I'd urge anyone to go to NJ211's uh, IDA page, which really does a great job helping individuals navigate potential nonprofit resources that are available out there. All great stuff. So nj.gov slash IDA is a sort of summary of all the state uh resources that are available and how to find them. NJ211 uh, is great for nonprofits who help. Pat Callahan, I know you're on, but you have a, uh, some video issue. You mentioned there were 75 AmeriCorps volunteers that were moving into New Jersey to, to, to as Dan said, get the muck out and do other things like that. How, how would folks be able to connect with them uh, if they wanted that help? Pat, are you there? If somebody could shoot Pat a note, Aliana, let's go to the, your, your next question if we could. We have a question from Jim from Hopewell. He asks, how can communities access funding to redo their stormwater systems to make them more resilient to large storms? And can communities still access Blue Acres funds? Yeah, both very good questions. Uh, why don't, Sean, do you wanna take a shot at that? And uh, Dan may wanna fill in. <clears throat> Sure. So two, two questions there with respect to making our stormwater infrastructure more resilient. Uh, a couple of years ago, the governor uh, signed a law making it uh, possible for any community in New Jersey who wished to have a better stormwater management to create a stormwater utility. Uh, DEP has uh, put together the guidance materials uh, that will help uh, our local communities uh, develop those utilities. Uh, and through the development of those utilities also provide access uh, to the funding mechanisms that allow us to enhance our water infrastructure uh, through a program 
uh, through the New Jersey Water Bank, which is a partnership between DEP and the iBank. Uh, any uh, community can apply for clean water funds to enhance their stormwater infrastructure. Uh, we've been uh, lucky under the governor's leadership to facilitate over $1.5 billion uh, in those types of infrastructure improvement projects in the last three years. Uh, on the Blue Acre side, uh, similarly, uh, the governor signed legislation that has made uh, a state dedication uh, to funding the Blue Acres program, not, not just being funded as it previously was from federal dollars. And so to the extent that you, have a, that you and your community are interested in learning more about that program, you can go to uh, the resource page that, that Dan mentioned uh, and uh, have access to DEP uh, and we can hold an information session in your town uh, about the Blue Acres program. Um, well said. Uh, maybe Tim Hillman, who's on, could connect Jim from Hopewell uh, with uh, any of this stuff that uh, Sean just referred to. You know, the Blue Acres is a, is a, is a sort of become a term of art, um, but it's an important one here. And that is, um, it, it may well be that no matter how good a set of projects that we do with the feds, with the Army Corps, with what we do in the state, if, if we get an A plus on everything, it may still well be that your house is in an area that is it's just unavoidable given the, the, the way the world is headed in terms of exposure. Uh, and the Blue Acres program is if you, if you raise your hand, it's a fair and civil way to basically take you out of your house and convert that area uh, into a natural runoff, uh, which, by the way, in and of itself, uh, would be an extra weapon uh, to be able to deal with mitigation going forward. Pat, I had mentioned a couple of minutes ago, we were talking about resources that were available, including volunteers. And I mentioned that you had said earlier today, AmeriCorps had 75 bodies that were coming into Jersey to clean out muck, et cetera. And I was wondering, 30 seconds on that, and how can people uh, raise their hand and, and see if they can partake of that assistance. That's correct, Governor. I apologize for this mobile connection. Uh, we are our recovery bureau is working with the 12 uh, county OEM coordinators. So we will make sure that residents uh, can take full advantage if they need it. Again, their house is cleaned out and water damage material. Uh, I will have that information out when Aliana sends out the resource information that I'll make sure that OEM has that, uh, whether that's on readynj.gov or they have to go to their specific OEM coordinators to make sure that if they raise their hand and say, hey, I would love some help, we'll make sure we get it to them. And, and Pat, this help is in the vein of literally getting mud out of your basement, so to help, is that right? Fit. And, and all kinds of materials from the, the damaged drywall to furniture and all that. I mean, a lot of that's happened already, but there's probably still a considerable amount of residents and citizens that could use that assistance if they want to get back into their, uh, their you know, their homes and, and be in a good safe space. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, Aliana. So Doris from Westfield asks, how do I find honest and reliable contractors? Is there a resource registry available, especially for seniors? Yeah, so this is one. Uh, Pat and I had this conversation at our press conference earlier today. There is the, most overwhelmingly people do the right thing in New Jersey, right? Whether you're a homeowner, whether you're a contractor, whether you're no matter who you are. But there are, you know, there's a special place in hell for the folks out there who try to take advantage of folks in their deepest, darkest hour of needs. I don't know whether or not, Dan, you're the best person to ask or Justin Zimmerman uh, from Department of Banking and Insurance is on with us, uh, but where can folks, where can Doris go uh, to make sure that she's dealing with somebody who is reputable uh, and crosses all T's and dots I's as it relates to trusting? Sure, Governor, I, I can handle that one. And um, the Division of Consumer Affairs within the Attorney General's office has really spearheaded this effort in terms of putting information out there about avoid, avoid being scammed post a disaster, whether that's in home repair in their contractors or uh, charitable fraud, someone representing a charity that maybe isn't really doing the right thing. The nj.gov slash IDA page has a link to the Division of Consumer Affairs that has a great two page sort of document, step by step, things to look out for when you sign a contract with a contractor, um, how much you should put up front, 
and a, a number to call uh, if you have any questions or concerns, which is 973-504-6240. Uh, that's, that's to you know, uh, basically report any kind of instances of um, you know, uh, any red flags that come up, anyone who's an unscrupulous actor, really, really, really helpful step-by-step uh, uh, -step guide that, that consumers can tap into on uh, the, the nj.gov uh, slash IDA page from Division of Consumer Affairs. Great, Dan. Aliana, can you include that number uh, in our email, post uh, call email? Thank you, Dan. Aliana, back to you. So our next, um, the person, this person didn't give their name, but they ask an important question. They ask, dealing with the damage from the storm on top of everything else has me feeling really stressed out right now. Is there someone I can talk to? Yeah, the answer is, thank God, yes. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, the Acting Commissioner of the Department of Human Services, Sarah Edelman, who's doing a terrific job to weigh in on that. And my guess is, Sarah, um, having had this conversation with you before, there's gonna be some more websites and phone numbers. So let's make sure Aliana, these get captured in our follow-up email as well. Sarah, over to you. Yes, thanks, Governor. And I'm so glad this person asked this question because the pandemic had already taken an emotional toll on all of us and Ida has really piled on with new loss and grief and challenges. So at the same time that you're asking for our help with your insurance applications and your physical needs, help is also available to deal with the emotional impacts of Ida. Um, and there are three easy ways to talk with someone that are confidential and free. So number one, the um, at each of the disaster recovery centers, as long as they're open, trained disaster response crisis counselors are available in person if you want to speak with someone in person at any of those locations. Number two, you can call the New Jersey Mental Health Cares Line. It's open seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And you can speak with a trained counselor there. Um, this is available in multiple languages using translators. And the number is 866-202-HELP, which is 4357. And we'll include that in the resources. Um, and then number three, you can also text HOPE to 51684, and you'll hear back from a counselor over text message. We also have these resources available in American Sign Language for anyone um, who may need that. So we'll make sure all of those are included in the resources. Sarah, thank you. We made this point a lot a few weeks ago when Ida first hit. And by the way, before that, Henri, Dan and I were in the Helmetta, we were in Monroe, different storm. But after 18 months of this darn pandemic, you feel like, I remember saying this in Milburn where, where a ton of small businesses got wiped out. Uh, you just feel like you're just barely getting back in your feet and you get clobbered again. And, and, and it's, it's no surprise that there's a lot of mental health stress out there. So Sarah, thank you for that. Aliana, back to you. So Cameron from Somerset asks, how can I provide help or volunteer with people who need assistance for Ida recovery? That's a great one. Bless you, Cameron, for asking. Is it, Dan, the best place, nj.gov slash Ida? Is there a place to sign up to help on there as well? Yeah, Gov, I, I would actually direct people here to uh, New Jersey Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster, NJVOAD for short. Uh, and that's really your central point for helping providers of these services, these nonprofit services to uh, survivors, really helping them register and gather volunteers as well as coordinate donations. So that's NJVOAD. Um, and I will, you know, I'll put in the uh, link, the exact uh, link to that website. Okay, that's great. And then, Aliana, you'll also include that in the follow-up, uh, in your follow-up email. Let's keep rolling. So we had several questions on FEMA eligibility. Belinda from Newark wants to know, what are the income guidelines for FEMA eligibility? Is it Belinda? Yes, Belinda. Yeah. Am I right in saying on the grant money, Patrick, there are no uh, income uh, guidelines? Yeah, that's correct, Governor. Uh, for FEMA's housing assistance programs, uh, it's not income based at all. It's simply based on your housing needs. Um, the SBA loan ap applications have income information. And that's, you know, like I said, if people don't qualify for that, then they might go back for more grants from FEMA. So those, those things are income based, but, but FEMA's housing programs are not. Did you have other, thank you, Patrick, other eligibility questions, Aliana? Um, yes, so uh, Antigua from Roselle. Who's that? 
Antigua from Roselle wants to know, um, can we get assistance, can FEMA supply assistance for um, replacement of personal items? Patrick, that's one we get a lot. Well, how, how, how would you answer that? Yeah, uh, well, like I said, FEMA's initial round of housing assistance is really just made to make sure people have a habitable place to stay. But the Small Business Administration Disaster Loan Program, that can help with, uh, with personal items. And for essential personal items, uh, that second round of FEMA grants can help. Actually, even, even FEMA's housing, uh, initial housing has, uh, has certain items that they consider essential to make the place habitable. So those, those items like a refrigerator, uh, even the water heater for people with flood, flooded basements and, and boiler and things like that, those, those things are all covered under that. And you're distinguishing on, in terms of belongings between, as you say, a stove or a refrigerator on the one hand and a personal effect on the other hand, um, right? Correct, those, those things that, that are required to make the place habitable would fall yeah. under the housing programs, but then the SBA loan program can help with, with most things that you lost yep. and some other things, if you get referred back to FEMA, they can cover essential essential belongings, furniture, and things like that. Tragically and sadly, it's so many of the memories in that category that no, no amount of money can bring grant loan or otherwise. Um, Pat Callahan wanted me to add Doris's, uh, I think it was Doris's uh, good question, the question about Aliana, who asked about uh, unscrupulous contractors? Was that Doris? Yes, it was Doris. Yeah. So Pat also makes the point that the, the Department of Community Affairs can let people know if, if a business has a legal action outstanding against them, uh, which is obviously a red flag. So wanted to add that. Thank you, Pat. Aliana, what do you what do you got? So our next question, uh, I don't have a name, but do you recommend that homeowners get flood insurance moving forward, even if they live in a no flood area? Please, God, yes. I'm glad somebody asked this question. Yes, yes, yes. Um, folks, and I don't know where we lost the plot as a nation, but at some point, somewhere along the line, th there was th 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 it seeped into our natural uh, sort of method of operation that if you're in a floodplain, you need flood insurance, and if you're not, you don't. That's just not that's just not true. Everybody ought to get flood insurance, and and, and sooner is better than later, given the, the the steady clip of these storms and their intensity. Um, I that's a good way to ask Justin Zimmerman, Department of after all the Department of Banking and Insurance. Justin, anything you want to add to that, and any advice on if folks don't know where to go right now to get flood insurance, where should they go? Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Governor. Um, so aside from the uh, National Flood Insurance Program, which as we know is a federal program, which is the primary provider of, of flood insurance, um, and a uh, New Jersey resident can go to floodsmart.gov. We also have private flood insurance, which is an option for many New Jerseyans. Um, one of the things consumers should be aware of is that flood insurance is not effective until 30 days after it's sold. And I would um, encourage uh, the residents to go talk to a broker um, to try to purchase that at this time. Justin, what's the website again for the federal? So the federal website is floodsmart.gov. And I can thank you. And then the private, the private stuff is basically go to- Exactly. Your favorite insurance company. Um, and a broker, the good thing about a broker, and the reason to go to a broker, I assume that's why you, you said that word deliberately, is a broker can hopefully help you hunt for the best deal out, out there that's not just the best deal financially, but the most suitable given your circumstances. That's exactly right. Okay, thank you. Good to have you on. Give Marlene our best. Thank you. Aliana, back to you. So piggybacking off of the last question, Marilee in the Q&A box asks, flood insurance can be cost prohibitive for many, fam cost prohibitive for many families. What are assistance programs available to help those families? That's a very good question. Justin, do you wanna jump in on that and then we'll throw it to anybody else out there who may, may have a view? So um, thanks, Governor. The uh, big piece on that is that is what we just talked about, which is to speak to a broker because the broker can work with you to try to purchase um, coverage uh, that is affordable for you and for your situation. Um, other than that, I think if they have any other additional questions, they could contact us just to kind of talk through what options are out there. Um, we obviously can't recommend any type of broker 
but um, the department's consumer uh, protection number is uh, 1-800-446-7467. Patrick, anything on the federal side? Is, is, is SBA got anything in their arsenal uh, for uh, helping folks out with defraying insurance costs? Uh, well, FEMA does. FEMA might be able to help people if, if uh, flood insurance is, is required in their area. To uh, FEMA might be able to pay for uh, for an initial period of flood insurance for people who just had damage. Um, but also, as, uh, as as you were saying, Governor, it's flood insurance is so important, even if you're not in a flood zone. First of all, we're seeing flooding in areas that haven't been traditionally flood zones more and more often. And secondly, flood insurance is 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 a lot more money than FEMA could ever give you. Uh, and uh, and in fact, FEMA might not be able to give you anything if it's just your house that floods next time or just your block and it's not a federal disaster. The flood insurance will always be there for you. So yeah, we highly encourage anybody to get flood insurance as well. Great point. Dan, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, Governor, if, if to bring everything full circle here, you're, you're the only way to lower flood insurance is to lower your risk and bring that back to what are we doing going forward and really what DEP is working on. If you elevate your home, your flood insurance rate will go down as low as about it, it can go. You still need to buy flood insurance, but you'll be the lowest risk profile. Now, most people come back to me and say, well, I don't have $150,000 to elevate my home, and that's understandable. There's a lot of federal money that will cover, if not the entire cost, large portions of it, if you mitigate your flood-prone home. So I'd look into elevation as a way to lower your flood insurance rate, and it helps the state from this happening again going forward. Great points. Absolutely great points. I want to go back to something that Patrick said that you got people who are flooding who may have never flooded before. I, I've met them. I, I met tragically, I mentioned uh, earlier 30, the, the tragedy of 30 losses of life. I met Mrs. McGee in Irvington with their great mayor, Tony Boss. She lost her husband and her daughter uh, were killed. And their flood, I think she said she'd been there for 40 years. They had never flooded before. It's the first time it had ever happened. So we're in a race to get out of get out in front of this. And it's going to take, unfortunately, it's going to take a while, uh, even with the quick hits that we know we can do, which means we need a you need a bridge, a, a, a financial bridge. You need a, a smart way to, to all of us, for all of us to bridge from today until we know uh, at some point that we'll have more resilient uh, infrastructure and more mitigation weapons. That meeting that Cory Booker was going back into was about, I assume, the infrastructure bill and the reconciliation. And, and there's a lot of climate resilience infrastructure embedded in that, which clearly we're reminded constantly how much we need it. Thank you. Ali, let's take a couple more before we break, if that's all right. Great. So Rachel in the Q&A box asks about mental health in children. So she's, she wants to know if we are already working with on the ground community mental health advocates and practitioners to prepare children for times of crisis like Ida or Sandy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Sarah, weigh in if you could with a couple of words on that. Sure. Another great question. Those mental health resources I talked about are available um, for any families who want to to call in. There's also been significant um, funding provided as a result of COVID to our schools to help uh, build additional mental health resources for children. And our sister agency, the Department of Children and Families, also has a number of resources for children mental health. So we can make sure, Eliana, that you have some of that information to provide in the follow-up material as well. Well said. So, so those phone numbers and websites aren't just for adults. Um, they're, they're for families and kids. And, and the Department of Children and Families is not represented on here, but it's great. Great Commissioner Christine Norbert Byer has got a lot going on there. And again, Aliana can include some of their contact information. Thank you. Aliana, back to you. So Laura Mont from Montclair asks, can you share information on FEMA assistance specifically for businesses post-IDA? Yeah, so, so Patrick, here we go. I'm a, I'm a small business, uh, so it's not my home, it's my business. I mentioned Milburn was the, was the example I used where just devastating impact on small businesses. Just because I'm a business though, doesn't mean I shouldn't still go to FEMA, is that right? And then FEMA would take you on to SBA or what, what's the order of steps you would recommend? Well, FEMA is one way you can get to Small Business Administration loans for businesses. 
Um, you, if you register with us, we can we can channel you over to the Small Business Administration, or you can go directly to the Small Business Administration at sba.gov or their their 800 number that we'll put we'll put in the chat room. Yeah. Um, yeah, they have they have uh, loans for businesses, very low interest, long term. They're very uh, favorable terms, and they they'll work with you for something that works with you. Um, and they do it for physical damage and for economic injury. So if people have simply lost business due to uh, the disaster. That's another category of of disaster loans for businesses that they offer. That's an important one. That last uh, sentence from Patrick: uh, economic damage, meaning. I was closed for a month and missed out on X thousands of dollars of revenue that otherwise would have been coming in the door. You can apply for help there as well. Great. Thank you for that, Laura. Uh, Aliana? So Luis asks, can we expect, that? Luis in the chat box, I don't have a town, uh, but he asks, can we expect more help through the NJEDA for micro and small businesses? He says they need a bridge until the insurance will consider their claims. Yeah, so I, I think on this one, Tim Hillman, we, we may want to get back to Luis. Um, Tim Sullivan, the CEO of the NJEDA, put $10 million on the street immediately, uh, most of it for hurricane or tropical storm, Ida, small business damage, uh, but a small but important meaningful slug for uh, uh, Henri. Um, and I, I don't know where, we, maybe, uh, Dan, you may well know this. I don't know how far, or Tim, how deep into that 10 million uh, have we gone? Has it, has it been expired? I think the grants for were in the range of $1,000 to $5,000 per business. Uh, any sense, Dan, where that stands? I know applications closed uh, two Fridays ago, the 24th, and I think we, we fully expect that those funds will be expended there. And Governor, this is why it's so important that Senator Booker is fighting for us in Congress right now to get additional federal funding in. A portion of that federal funding that's out there, the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Money, the HUD money, that can be used for additional business support. So it's 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 potential that additional funding will be out there, but that first 10 million slug obviously was uh, was in high demand. Uh, we'd have to replenish it with additional federal funds, hopefully that get that get awarded from Congress. Yeah, I mean that's something. Uh, if we have the financial latitude, that's something we want to do. We've put out. This is more. This is COVID, not Ida. We're we're number three in the country behind only California and New York in terms of putting money on the street for small businesses. Um, somewhere between 750 and 800 million dollars uh, and we want to do more because small businesses have had a real one-two punch here. Aliana, let's try to squeeze one or two more. Sure. Andrew in our Q&A box says that his um, insurance denied his um, car claim and he wants to know if there are other avenues from help. He was also denied by FEMA. He's also denied by FEMA. Okay, so let me go to Justin first and then Patrick. As I said, don't take no for an answer. That was That's our mantra here. Uh, I've seen with my own eyes hundreds of cars that, that, when I say damaged, completely totaled. So they may look reasonable, but they're they're gone. Um, and Dan Kelly had put together a, a very good Uber Lyft program in the immediate aftermath of that. But Justin, what advice do you have for somebody who's got a failed claim? I don't know how you could have a failed claim on this. It's uh, extraordinary that an insurance company would would deny a claim given these cars are clearly ruined. Um, what advice, Justin? Sure. Thank you, Governor. I mean, first, I would say that the department is monitoring uh, the response that the companies are, are giving to New Jersey residents. So, um, you know, if, if this, uh, if Andrew, you have any questions or, or concerns, obviously, with how your claim was handled, please call 1-800-446-7467. Uh, um, however, damage to personal and commercial vehicles from flood is really only covered when you have comprehensive coverage. Um, so if a resident doesn't have comprehensive coverage, um, unfortunately, that would not be covered. And that includes sort of your, your SAFE, your, your special automobile insurance policy or dollar a day. That does not cover flood. And in that instance, we would um, send uh, you, Andrew, to FEMA. So I'll you know, punt it over to you. Uh, yeah, that's a good segue, Patrick. Back over to you. Any thoughts there? Uh, yeah, uh, your caller was right to apply to FEMA. Um, we may be able to help in one of two ways. One is, uh, like I said, it's not part of a habitable living environment, but we refer first to the SBA. So if the Small Business Administration sends that loan application, they might be able to help with the car in that. And if they get rejected for the Small Business Administration loan, they might be able to help 
uh, through that second round of other needs assistance grants that FEMA can help if they get rejected by SBA. Well said. And again, Justin, we'll include that Aliana in that email. Let's do one more and then we'll then we'll give it a wrap. So Marty in our chat box says that his home was destroyed destroyed by Ida, um, but they again found out that he was denying the claim. Um, he said he hasn't heard back from FEMA and is there a way that he can expedite the process? Yeah, uh, from Marty, uh, Patrick, am I right in saying your suggestion is to simply pick up the phone and call FEMA back? Uh, yeah, that's the first thing I would try. Uh, call us back at 1-800-621-FEMA, that's 3362. Uh, and also you can go to one of our recovery centers. So you can use the FEMA app or our website, find out the FEMA recovery, disaster recovery center nearest you, uh, and they can help you in person. Patrick, just because I mentioned earlier, Pat Callahan, Callahan and I mentioned at our press conference that the Morris and Mercer centers are closing this week. Uh, two, two questions to make sure everyone understands. Number one, that doesn't mean all of them are closing. And secondly, just because you're not in that county does not mean you can't go to that site. Is that accurate? That's correct. Anyone can go to any disaster recovery center. And uh, the, the other ones are open. We just wanted to move resources to the places that were showing more need. Uh, and we're in fact looking for other locations as well. And we're, we have some even some mobile vans going out directly to, uh, to the disaster affected areas to, uh, to help people as, as, as directly as we can. Terrific, terrific. Um, so listen, um, thanks to all of you. I wanna thank Patrick uh, and Corey Booker especially, uh, but also I wanna thank uh, Sean, Pat Callahan, Dan Kelly, Sean LaToretta, who said Sarah Edelman, Justin Zimmerman and the whole team at FEMA and uh, SBA who are on, Tim Hillman and Dan Bryan are also on from our team and, and uh, our host, Aliana Alfaro Post, who uh, did a great job last minute standing in for Deb Cornabaca. Keep Deb in your prayers. Again, Aliana, you're gonna send around an email to anybody who registered for this call and we'll be explicit. This website is, is for this reason this phone number you should call because, uh, and we'll lay that out for you. If we continue to think that th there is a lot of unanswered questions, uh, we, we reserve the right to do this again and we'll do it. And as I said, the road, I wish I could say this is overnight, but it's not, uh, it's gonna be a long road, but I promise you, uh, we're gonna stay with you. And again, Patrick in particular, I thank you for your partnership uh, at the federal level and to each and every one of you. Stay strong, everybody, and keep well. Be well.